Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are here at the beautiful Gansvert Hotel on Park Avenue in Manhattan today, and I have a very special guest joining me today, a fascinating woman who has broke the woman's code and has produced this book, Happy Woman, Happy World. So perhaps for the new year, your New Year's resolution is to be happier, follow your dreams, and get rid of all that negativity in your life. This is a show that you must not miss, if that is the case. Beate Chalette, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Jason. I am so excited to be on your show. I am too. I am too. I, I find your work absolutely fascinating. And, and as we were talking before the show started, I did get to read some of your book. And it's a lot of things that I think myself can relate to as well as our audience. Thank you. Yes, I found that while it's a book primarily geared toward women, but I have heard that men have also gotten quite a lot of good information out of it. I mean, the concepts are really universally applicable. Absolutely. So, um, well, I'd like to get started because it is a fascinating <laughs> book and you are a fascinating guest, as I had said. Uh, take us back a little bit. It was about 13 years ago or so that um, you were going through some hardships and some negativity yourself prior to this book. Yes, exactly. I think, you know, when I hear my own story, I always get very excited. I'm like, wow, that sounds really amazing. But then, you know, it wasn't always amazing. So I had a lot of uh, really terrible hardships and big blows, you know, not like little tiny little blows, but big survival blows. And I went, um, you know, I'm a single mom. I raised my daughter by myself. She's now 21 and I'm an immigrant. So I'm originally from Germany. So I came here entirely by myself. And I, you know, I was laid off like a lot of people uh, were laid off in, uh, in the first big recession. And then I had to figure out how to sort of run a business because I'm unemployable. You know, too many ideas, too difficult, whatever you may call it. And I found myself, you know, thrown into this, building this business with a small child. I was already going through a divorce because the big Northridge earthquake came. And wow. when something like that shakes you to your core and you go, uh, wow, you know, uh, this could have been my last day, you make some very big decisions based on that because if this is really your last day, how much, how much more time do you have to waste? So I did that and uh, filed for divorce, had just set up my business. So the, you know, the earth and all of this happens a few months after I just set up my first wow. business. When it rains, it pours. Oh, it, and it, you know, and that was just the beginning. And from there on, it just kept coming and coming and coming. And I eventually, you know, built my business up. I was a, a still photography producer. A lot of people came to Los Angeles to produce. I worked with Mercedes-Benz and I worked with BMW, Macy's, Fredericks of Hollywood. I mean, you know, big, cli great clients to produce for. Absolutely. And I was sort of this cool, like, <laughs> urban, you know, chick in, in, in Los Angeles and people knew how to find me. I mean, it was really great. I could see that about you. You have such a big, bubbly personality <laughs> about you. <laughs> Thank you. And I was having a great time and I was at the same time representing photographers. But then what happened is that an um, employee got a little too close to one of my photographers and they had this idea how to run my business without me. And next thing I know, invoices that I had billed to clients were not paid to me, but paid to them. And I found out that they had literally conspired to, you know, to get me out of business, put me out of business and to take over oh my, my photography representation business. And if that wasn't enough, then six months later, when the production season was rolling around, I thought I was going to recover. And, you know, and I had juicy production season booked, half a million dollars worth in production volume, and then, uh, and then the airplanes tore into the towers. Oh, my goodness. And yes. I lost all of my production volume overnight. I, in, within 24 wow. hours, the phone kept ringing and ringing. So, you know, I'm in this lawsuit. Um, I have no clue what I'm doing. I just lost my first, the first part of my business, and I just lost the second part of my business. And I have to come up with a plan, and I have to come up with it really fast. So I had this idea of building a stock syndication for architecture and interior photography, but I was broke, you know, and then the lawsuit settled, it's all paid, and now it's at zero again. So all of this for nothing. And then I started rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding, but I'm out of money, so I'm now over $130,000 in debt. Wow. I have a great idea, though. And so, you know, so this is sort of the story of how you, 
You know, how do you, how do you survive when year after year after year there's another thing that comes and then you think I've mastered that and then there's another thing coming. And so for me, you know, as if that wasn't enough and then I go to Germany, my father has a stroke. But it wasn't a stroke, he had pancreatic cancer. Uh, and so my father passed away within six weeks. I'm oh, sorry. And now I'm in Germany and it's a day like this, you know, it's the first day of spring but it's a, it's a snowstorm. And I'm at the grave, my phone rings from Los Angeles, and it's my office, and we've just been served a notice from the landlord. So what do you do when your worst case scenario, now, you know, yeah. now my worst case scenario has happened. And then 18 months after this horrible, horrible mo moment in time, I sold my, bu my business for millions of dollars to Bill Gates. So I remember when I was going through these really difficult times, Jason, that I always thought someone must be able to derive a benefit from what I'm going through because it's just not normal. How did you find the strength to pull out of all of these hardships? I think one of the most important things when we're going through these, these terrible things, this adversity, is we have to remember that it's not going to always be like this. So that was my first thought. It was like, it can't be like this forever. The second thought I had is, I have to find a way to focus on just like one thing at a time because it got so bad that I couldn't even think it a month at a time or a year at a time. I mean, it was a week at a time. It was a day at a time. Sometimes it's an hour at a time. So I think when we start breaking things down a little bit more and going to what can I do today? What can I do in the next hour? What's my first step? And then just take that first step and then the next step then you know somehow you make it through it. But for many years, I tried really hard not to even to think about how bad it was because it was just about how am I going to make it to today, through today? How am I going to make it through the end of the month? And then you know something else would, would sort of happen. Did you ever feel like giving up? I mean, I know you had your daughter at the time, and, and you, as you said, it's just for today. It'll get better. It'll get better. But was there ever a time when you're like, it's just not going to get better. Did you ever feel like giving up? Yeah, all the time. All the time. But I have this, you know, I, I think that Eleanor Roosevelt said it really best. She says, you never know how strong a woman is. She, women, she says, women are like tea bags. You never know how strong she is until you throw in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of, you know, I, I thought... And this is sort of a big message that I have for, you know, for our audience is when you are in, in hot water, it's like, will you really let that define you? And that was, for me, the big message is like, will I allow this to define who I am or am I going to be the one who will define it? And I say, you know, will you be defined by your circumstances or will you define your circumstances? Hmm, interesting. So fascinating, but you have cracked the code, the women's code <laughs> as it's called. How did you do that and what exactly is the women's code? Very good. Well, the women's code is uh, really um, a way on how women can achieve career, love, success, happiness, money, health, whatever they want without going absolutely crazy. <laughs> and. You know, For some, I, that might be the hard part, not to go crazy. Not to go crazy, but we're all overwhelmed. Everyone yes. is overwhelmed. There's so much going on all the time. So it's about how do you get from overwhelmed to awesome. So that's the code. And it, you know, it has tools. It has, it has proprietary ideas that I've developed. It has, you know, I have online courses. I do, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do events. Wow. So it's all about how can we teach women, how can we show women how to get from this but I want a career, I want a relationship, I want children, I want to be successful, I want to look good. So we want, 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 but we can't seem to cramp it all in, you know, in, in one life or in one day. And so that's what the Women's Code is. It's sort of the, the solution to, to fixing your life and saving your sanity. And I think a lot of women too, and myself included, that not that I'm a woman, but I can relate to, you do have a bunch of ideas and you're spread out all over the map basically. This will also, your code will also teach them how to prioritize and, and basically get organized, get these goals organized in order and just start checking them off the list as you go along. Yes.
Yes, and that's I think the the to me you know maybe it's because I'm German and it's like the German engineering in me. <laughs> <laughs> but I always I like, like that. I always like to look at these like complex processes, and I I wonder how do I take that and how do I you know how do I sort of cut it into slices, and that's sort of my first analogy, you know that where I say you know if we were to look at our lives you know like a loaf of bread right. And instead, you know, and we're very hungry. We want it all. You know, it's fresh out of the oven. It's crispy. But, you know, am I going to take this and shove it in my mouth? It's not possible, right, to take a bite out of everything. Right. So what if we were to take a bread knife and we slice it into slices, you know, and some are a little thicker, some are a little thinner. Maybe you want one with jam, one with, you know, the Italian style. Maybe a couple go in the freezer for later. So we get to consume the whole loaf just not all at once. And that's what the Women's Code is all about, is about let's not try to have everything all the time all at once, but let's, let's, let's cut it into slices, waves, phases, or I call them ego rhythms. Interesting. I like it. And as I said, I mean, I got through halfway through the book already, and it's absolutely fascinating to me. So in just a little bit, we're actually going to touch more on some of those uh, table of contents and what those chapters are about. But there was something interesting as well that I had seen off of your website about women, how they do not always get along in business or in life. And it kind of stems all the way back to childhood, where, where we stem back to bullying, which is a huge yes. epidemic still in this country to this day. Yes. And... And I actually, when I did the research for, for the book, I was always amazed on how we are at each other's throat all the time. There's, nobody knows why. It's just always the, been, the, been the way it was. And then when I did my research, it all of a sudden dawned on me, Jason, it's because we are genetically destined to act that way. And this is a very easy thought process. And when I tell you this, you're going to go, wow, this is so simple. But back, you know, way, 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 way early, men would go and they go out hunting. So John was the best shot, Jack was the fastest, Scott was the best skinner, and then, you know, Jason was the guy with the strategy. It didn't matter if you liked him or not, but they were the authority on the subject. And so it was clear that your team was the strongest, you know, the task was going to be performed the best if you had the A-listers on your team. But nobody ever worried on whether you liked each other. If that sort of was, if that happened naturally, it wasn't a big deal, you know, then yeah, you know, great, you know, the brothers are, are together. But we, at the same time, we stayed at home. We were depending on others to provide for us. So all we ever did was hover over what we had, fearful, trying to protect it. And so it's been only 50 years when feminism started to change our thinking from, you know, protecting what we have to also having the ability to choose absolutely everything. And now we are faced with this old, outdated behavior, but with the new wisdom. And so how do you take with what we've always done and what we know, now know and put it together? And then women got really upset with feminists and they said, well, feminism failed us because they didn't tell us what the outcome was. Right. But in the women's code, we say, well, we don't blame the feminists either because feminism was about equality and about giving us the same opportunity. So feminism got us from here to here. It is really now us. We are the first generation who really has figured it out on how to have absolutely everything and how to make it work together. So it's our job now to figure out how to have a balance between the old and the new thinking and then teach the generations to come. And then our kids are going to go, but you, you, you missed this one thing and we don't even know what it is yet, right? <laughs> and then it's going to be their job to figure it out. So we just need to tame it down, take it down a little bit. Absolutely, and it's all explained in your book here. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's touch a little bit more on that now, actually. Um, the chapters are absolutely fascinating, as I've said, and I've kind of broken down the ones that I think our audience could most relate to. So I'll just, I guess I'll just go sure. down the list, and then we can kind of discuss it a little bit more. The first chapter that I have here on my little list is what women want. What do women want exactly overall? Or, or based on your book here, what is it that women want? I think that for the most part, women want everything. 
The problem is with wanting everything is that most of the time it's not defined. So if I say I want everything, what does that mean for me? <clears throat> and so in the chapter we talk about really on how to identify, you know, what is it that you want? Because when we go out and we, you know, we say everything, is that a career, is that a job, is that love? What is that exactly for you? So for me it's always been about what do I, is what I want the same as everyone else want? And since I've been, you know, putting the code out, now I realize not every woman wants the same. It looks very different in each woman's life, and it's about defining what it is that, you know, each woman wants, and then mapping out a way on how to get that, and then making it a choice. And then, if it's my choice... So not choice, so much a need, but yes. as a choice. Okay. Yeah, not the victim of your circumstances, but if that's what I want, if I want children, and then I'm, you know, with the kids at home, and it's crazy, then that was my choice. Now I have a much easier time to deal with that because I now remember consciously with awareness that this is my choice. Wow. Fascinating. Well, there is definitely much more to talk about. We are due for our first break here. and we come back, more with Beate and happy woman, happy world. We'll be right back. If you love The Jason Galka Show, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to be a guest on our show, send an email to thejasonshow at yahoo.com. Welcome back. If you just tuned in, today my guest is Beate Schillat, originally from Germany, and she is here in the United States now, and has this fascinating book, Happy Woman, Happy World. She has also cracked the women's code, which we just spoke about in our previous segment. Beate, great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So we're going through your book here now, and as I said, I've broken down some of the most fascinating chapters that I think women can really relate to. So maybe we could just elaborate a little bit more on what they're about and just give um, our ladies a little bit more insight as to what they can expect when they pick up your book. So we just finished off with what women want, and again, that's the highlight of that chapter is about choice. It's not so much a need, but a want and a choice, yes. which is a lot different than a need, obviously. I think, I think the most important part for women to understand is that when you are clear about what it is that you want and then you have that somewhere written down or it's in your head and you in then first of all when you get it now you know you have achieved what you wanted. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like okay that was my choice and I'm not a victim and I want to get women out of this like uh, this is this is all happening you know, and get them in front of their lives and saying, this is what I wanted. I wanted the career. Now I got the career. Now I need to focus on the career. I wanted the relationship. Now I got the relationship. Now I'm going to have to take care of this relationship so that we really are constantly aware of that our life is the result of choices that we made and we like it. Excellent. Well, our next fascinating chapter is women's pursuit of happiness. Now that I'm sure is easier said than done. Yes, because a typical woman will wake up in the morning and, you know, and the scenario might be like I go in the bathroom and I look and I see, you know, a new wrinkle or, you know, some, some is, you know, I'm having a bad day. <laughs> so now I'm, I, you know, and then I put on my jeans. I'm going, wow, these are really a little bit tighter than they were uh, uh, a month ago. And then all of a sudden in my, in my head, some of my brain volunteers a whole flood of negative emotions, right? right. It's like, well, and you, you, you know, you haven't paid your bills, and you haven't worked out in two days, and you, you know, you've eaten really poorly you last night. You start really night. feeling like blah. I, I know, know. I'm the same way. I know. And next thing, you know, and it's not, it's five minutes later, and we're already beating ourselves up <laughs> over absolutely everything. I'm right there with you. I'm guilty of that. <laughs> you and everybody else. So... I, you know, that's how I came up with the triple paradox because it's like, why is it that we constantly are so negative with each other? And, you know, the pursuit of happiness really means is if I don't know what makes me happy, then how can I ever be happy? And it's okay, you know, to say this is making me happy and then get there and say, you know what, that was great. It makes me happy. It doesn't make me, you know, now I think I need something else to be happy. But I think for, for me, you know, and, and when... We talked earlier about sort of these hardships, right? It's like you got to get out of this, how do I survive to what makes me happy? Mm -hmm. And when I say to a five-year-old, hey, what makes you happy? How long do you think it takes a five-year-old to blurt out what makes them happy? <laughs> 
Less than a second. Less than a second. <laughs> so if I were to say, what will make you absolutely crazy happy right now? iPod. I'll... <laughs> That's the first thing that came to my head. <laughs> Very good. But at least you know. Right. But most people, when, I, you know, when I'm in a, in a live event or a conference, and I say, what makes you really happy, there's this awkward moment of silence. And I can see that we actually have to think about what makes us happy. And, you know, when you think about it, that's really sad that we yeah. can't blurt out chocolate ice cream or... Could that be because there is so much negative built, negativity built up in that person, perhaps, that they just have such low self-esteem that things are just not going right for them? Is, is that why you think it takes them so long to answer what would make them happy? I think we forgot. Honestly, I think we've forgotten to ask ourselves that question, what makes me really happy? Because from the moment we get up until the moment we go to bed, we are constantly plugged in. We get our self-esteem out of posting a selfie, and if we have 50 likes, we feel good, mm -hmm. right? But we don't think about what makes us really happy. But if I, if I, if I say what makes me really happy consciously, that I go and have, you know, like one of the things I really like is have a nice cup of tea. So when I get to do high tea, that's like to me a, a great thing. So I've made it a conscious choice when I, you know, at about three o'clock and I go make a cup of tea that I don't just go, you know, and heat up the water and it's like fast, 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 fast. Right. But in my head, I go like, I know that having a nice cup of tea makes me really happy. And so I now drink that cup just a little bit different with the awareness that this is something that I like. And I think this is what about, you know, the, the pursuit of happiness is all about, is when you know what makes you happy. Or whether that's chocolate ice cream, or a cup of tea, or a 20 minute bubble bath, or something else. As long as you have that awareness that then when you do it, that you're doing something that makes you happy, that you then take that moment to really experience that happiness. And I promise you, that's how you sort of get that happiness <laughs> back in your life. You have and to draw it in. I know, it's like, you know, we, we, we the hook, line, and sinker. So we, we have to get ourselves really into that mindset of, of saying, you know what, that's what I wanted. That's what makes me happy. I am happy now, and it changes energetically absolutely everything. And that's how I became from this miserable person a really happy person because now it's like, this is fun for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have said, oh my God, I'm going to New York, there's a snowstorm, how terrible, you know, all the <laughs> travel, but I'm going like, I am so excited because I like, I like this interaction. I like talking absolutely. about this. So it makes me happy, so I choose to be happy. But again, you weren't always this happy. I mean, how long exactly did it take you to reach this point? About 10 years, wow. a decade of bad luck, yeah. Wow. I mean, for anybody, that would be plenty of time to just give up and throw in the towel. But, I mean, your message here, obviously, is, is stay strong and, and pull through, which you have. Well, everybody has adversity. I have yet to find a life that reads you know, something great happened, something even greater happened, and then the really good thing happened, and then, you know, it got better and better and better. Most stories, and especially when we look at biographies from people that are successful or that have achieved a certain level, they all read the same. Things were bad, they got worse, and then, you know, the really bad stuff hadn't even happened yet until people get to their breaking point. And often, Jason, here's the thought. When we come to these breaking points, it really activates something in us where it's like, who are you going to be in all of this? Is that, you know, make a choice, and then you make a choice who you're going to be, and then you become that. And that's, I think, the message for that, that eventually clicked in. That's the code. That's what I cracked, is this is for me to define. And I had to get a way to get out of that and start defining. And you start defining it by making small steps. Mm -hmm. And then small steps lead to bigger steps and to leaps. I think part of the problem with um, our nation too is, is um, we don't have patience either. <laughs> I for one don't have patience myself but like I'm just listening as you're saying you have to start out small and go bigger and bigger each time but a lot of people just don't have the patience for that. Is there something or some way based on your book that can kind of help them with just being more patient and, and prioritizing as, as we were yes. talking about earlier? Yes. Absolutely. Well I am not patient. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> yeah. I mean, patience is for sissies, okay? <laughs> but, but you do learn that things come in due time. So 
like I early, like talked earlier about the loaf of bread. So this idea led me to develop this system that I call egorithms. So each slice stands for an egorithm, and I called it egorithm because, you know, I, I liked sort of this rhythmic concept of, you know, sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, mm -hmm. and it's like a wave or a phase. And very much, you know, and I always say like the surfer that goes out to surf never worries about if there's going to be another wave. He goes out with the intention to surf, so there will be a wave. There's going to be a big one, a little one. He may fall. He'll get back up. There's a storm. Mm -hmm. He can't go out. So our life is very much like that. So if we take that knife and we look at each slice, and each slice represents an egorithm, and I've identified nine main egorithms. And one egorithm, for example, is a career egorithm. One is a mom egorithm. One is a family and friends. One is health. One is tragedy because bad stuff just happens, and one is transition. So when I know which of the egorithms I'm in, you know, and in the book I explain exactly how to find out what your egorithm is. When you know which one you're you're in, then all of a sudden you're not looking at everything. You're looking at this slice because remember, it's a wave, it's a rhythm, it's 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 a movement. Absolutely. So this is now. So if I know where I am now, then I can put my main focus on that one thing. And every decision that I make, every choice I make is based on that one thing. Will it help or hurt that particular main focus? And all of a sudden, you know, when I when you know when since the book has been published, all of a sudden I hear from women, and this one woman from Seattle says. Thank you. I've been in knots, and now I realize that I'm really in my mom egorithm. But I was so worried that I was going to let my career egorithm ego drag along. But now I have my main focus on my child and being a mom, and I enjoy my life so much more. Fascinating. Fascinating. I mean, it's a lot of work to get where we want to be, but that, that's part of the journey. I think for me, like, especially, you know, we all have our goals in life yes. as, that we want to do, and we all have our list of priorities. And I think part of the exciting journey is just waiting for things to happen, you know, things like that, and just enjoying the path, you know, when things start moving more positive. And, and we can create that positivity of our own. Yes. I mean, that's what I had gathered yes. as well. So the final chapter that I'd like to discuss with you is Fix Your Life, Save Your Sanity. <laughs> <laughs> So in Fix Your Life, Save Your Sanity, I basically take everything that, you know, I've, I've sort of outlined in the book and put it all together. So, you know, it, it, it's sort of very simple. Mm -hmm. It's like if we know what we want, then it's very easy for us to go after what we want. Then we know where we are, because if I know where my egorithm is, now I know where I am, and now I know what I want. Now to map out what you know, how to get from what I want, from, from where I am to what I want is relatively easy. Because these are the two required ideas, you know, and I always describe it as when I'm in New York and I want to go from here to there, I need to know where I'm starting and I need to know where I'm going, and then I can map out the way. So that's, you know, the first concept. Without knowing any of that, any road will get you there because you have no clue what you're going. So that's the first thing. And then it's about making really conscious choices and using the three pillars of the Women's Code, which are awareness, support, and collaboration. Um, then I talk about leading on cue, you know, leading with compassion, uniqueness, and, empower and being empowered. So it's about all of these like little tools on how do, you, how do you become the person you want to be, how do you actually enjoy where you are more, while you map out the path to where you eventually want to be without this crazy insanity to always, you know, running after something that we don't even know what it is. Excellent. Well, Beate, perfect advice today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us today. If you'd like more information about Happy Woman, Happy World, be sure to visit her website at www.thewomenscode.com. You can always visit our website as well to rewatch your favorites or catch up on what you missed on The Jason Galka Show. I thank Gansbert Hotel for allowing us this lovely space today. And Beate, again, thank you so much <laughs> for being here with us today and sharing this with us. As always, I thank you at home for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.